So we're going to go, we're going to walk through some scriptures this morning. And the first one is 1 John 5 and 3. 1 John 5 and 3. You with me? Amen. And it reads, I'm reading from King James. I think the new King James may be on the screen, but it says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not greedy, grie, grievous. New King James says, for this is the love of God that we, look at your neighbor and say we, he's talking about us, us. We keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Hallelujah. Who wants a burden? Who likes a burden? Yeah, so he doesn't either. We're created in his, in his likeness and his image. Amen? So we have certainly gleaned a lot in this feast season this year of Sukkot. The first day, we blew the trump trumpet and we rejoiced. The tenth day, we learned what it really cost and what he really has done for us. Hallelujah. And we take this moment to give him praise. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. On the 15th day, he is a waypoint. We learned that he is a waypoint. Yeshua points the way to the Father, and the Father points back to Yeshua. He came to point us back to the Father, and the Father points us back to him as the only entry point. Point. Day 16, we learn we must do, we must be doers of the same. Study and activate, not eat and exercise, and not just, we must, sorry, I, let me fix that right. We must be doers of the same. We must study and activate. We must eat of this word and exercise. In other words, not just get fat. Amen. Day 17, we did as they did. We read the Torah and was taught in the temple. Because Pastor Catherine took us through Leviticus 23 in a teaching manner so that we would have a better understanding. And, you know, for those that say, we got to keep going back to Leviticus 23, we got, but that's what they did. They sat in the temple and they read the Torah. So, yeah, we, we, we're going to do as it was their custom, which is what Yeshua did when he was here. We're going to do that. Day 17, we did as they did, and we read the Torah and was taught in the temple. Day 18, we brought the teaching to a personal level and discussed why we do it. What's the purpose of doing a thing if you don't understand why you're doing it? And then once you understand why you're doing it, it should become a joy. It shouldn't be grievous as we just read in 1 John. It should become a joy for us to do. Day 19, that's today, and we want to talk about purpose. So when I look at 1 John 5 and 3, I highlighted the love of God. The love of God is not what we say, but what we do. That's love. Our, good, our God will not be a jive talker. And I know I'm aging myself here, but I know as, as a teenage girl and a young woman, we don't want no jive talker. Somebody just coming and tell us what we want to hear, telling you things that you know is not the truth, but you believe it because of where it's coming from and you want that flattery. That's not what he's all about. Love is not what you say. It is what you do. And I know most of us are more convinced about what someone does versus what they say. So, therefore, he, we, he's no different. So, he is, our, our God will not, is, does not want jive talking, and neither do we. The second word I took from that verse was keep. Keep means to attend to carefully, to take care of. You know, when I was studying this and I got to that word, keep, I understood more when he said, um, husbands love your wife like Christ loves the church. Because we can act real ugly, but he'll keep us. We learned this morning in Highlight Real that we try to cover ourselves, but it is he who does the ultimate covering. It means to guard and to observe. 
So when he says to keep my feast, he's saying to attend it carefully. Why am I bringing that home? Because it can't be a religious ritual ceremony for us. It's got to come from the heart. You got to take it personal that this is my time to commune with him. To guard and to observe. And then the third word I took from this, this passage was commandments. The Greek word for commandments is entole. That's the transliteration. And it means a prescribed rule in accordance with which a thing is done. So we've got a lot of details, which I'm going to go over with you this morning, on how we should be doing this thing. So when it comes to his feast, there's no guesswork. There's no doing it because I feel like it should be doing, done that way. There's no guesswork, and I'm doing it because this is the way I think it should be done. But if you're going to do it and guard it and take care of it and to observe it, we got to do it his way. And then the last word from that passage I took was grievous, heavy and weight, burdensome and weighty. Who wants to take that on? Nobody. So this is a time of rejoicing for us. Amen. The second set of passages, the scripture that I want to take you to is Deuteronomy 16, 14, and 15. Deuteronomy 16, 14, and 15. And from the King James Version, it says, and thou shalt rejoice. Thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and all that are within thy gates. Did anybody get left out? Can you guys help me there? Nobody was left out. Verse 15 says, seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose. Because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in thine increase and in all the works of thine hands. Therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. So therefore, not only are we going to keep his commandments and do it his way, He's given us something back in, in return because we know his word doesn't return to him void. He said, thou shalt surely rejoice and that he shall bless us in our increase and in the works of our hands. Rejoice. That word rejoice was twice in this passage. It's, rejoice means simply to be glad and it's opposite of grievous. So if you had, was hung up on grievous there, just be simply be glad why Yahweh doesn't want anything from us that is grievous do you do you want something from someone that they're giving it to you begrudgingly could you imagine me preparing this great dinner for you and I say here you go if you eat it it's probably going to give you indigestion or I'll take it personal I buy you a gift and I just throw it at you. Here you go. Or I just take it and sit it right here and say, Sister Sandra, that's for you when you get a chance to get it. How much meaning did that gift that I put on the altar for her really mean? And that's the way we've got to stop and think about what are we doing to our father. So rejoice is simply to be glad. It's opposite of grievous, and Yahweh doesn't want anything from us grievous, just like we don't want anything from anyone else grievously. There may still be some trying to understand why do it. Why celebrate the feast? Yahweh does nothing without purpose. I look at how he led up to this teaching today. We know he and his son are on the same page in reconciling us back to him. He doesn't want no job talkers. He wants some demonstrations of our love for him. Simple. Nike, their slogan, just do it. He gave us some specific instructions, and we must make it personal. If you come in here to look good and pass the site, stay home. If you come in here to go brag to somebody that I'm a little deeper than you because I know about the feast and I celebrate the feast, stay home. 
That's what grievous means. When it's not coming from your heart, it's grievous. Let's look at some details. Leviticus 23 and 34. Leviticus 23 and 34. And it reads, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. So you know me, I like to like look at details and try to figure some things out. So this is what I kind of figured out. I pulled from this. The 15th day, one plus five is equal to six. We know number six is the number of man. And seven is the number of perfection. What do you think he's telling us here? That this feast is for perfecting man to get us right so that we can tabernacle with him for a little while. For a little while? Oh, okay. I'm just, wake up, y'all, like we did on the day. Wake up! Wake up. So this is, the, when I looked at those numbers and I started to ask the Holy, Holy Ghost to reveal some things to me, one plus five equals six. That's the number of man, and seven is the number of perfection. So this period of time is to perfect us to tabernacle with him forever. Verse 39 reads, 23 and 39 reads, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. And on the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Also, the word also, when we look at this, man doing your affliction of self, which was the day of atonement, ridding yourself of self and filling yourself with more of me, you should now be able to gather in some fruits of your land. Set me on fire. That's so, uh, Yahweh is so awesome in that. So when I say gather in the fruits of your land, because remember I told you this is about man and perfecting us to be tabernacle with him. What fruits am I talking about? Love, joy, you know, the ones found in Galatians 5 and 22. Peace, long-suffering, because if you want it, if the truth be told, atonement is long-suffering for us. Why? We're denying ourselves of the things we like to do. We, I, I had a sister tell me, I like to eat. I'm not going to put her on blast, but she know who she is. I like to eat. I have some that say, I like to sleep. These are the things that we deprived ourselves of. So that's some long-suffering there. We purposely came out to do this because that's what he's asked of us. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So on the first day, we should come before him selfless, set me on fire. And on the eighth day, we will begin anew, more like him. Because we set, we set us on fire, we afflict our souls, we gathered in some fruit. And now we're more like him. None of this should be done in vain. So I repeat, if you're coming out to be big, to be grander, to brag, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Everything Yahweh does, he does with a purpose. So let's talk about this word purpose. Purpose is the reason why something is done or used. The aim or intention of something. The feeling of being determined to do or achieve something. The aim or goal of a person. What a person is trying to do or become. I repeat that for those of you that are taking notes. The reason, purpose, is the reason why something is done or used. The aim or intention of something. The feeling of being determined to do or achieve something. The aim or goal of a person, what a person is trying to do or become. It declares why you exist. So we should all be trying to seek what is my purpose. Because our purpose is more than looking pretty, going to fancy restaurants, and living in fancy houses. Amen? It declares why you exist. It captures the heart of why you are on this earth. 
and why Yeshua died for you. And when we think about what we learned about that, that what he went through, just imagine that they created things to make you bleed and tear out your skin. So when we think we don't take that for granted, mm -hmm. now to know why he died for us, it defines your life, not in terms of what you think, but what God thinks. It anchors your life in the character and call of God. It clarifies the non-negotiables. So there are some things we shouldn't be uh, negotiating when it comes to the things of God. We shouldn't be compromising in our walk, and we should walk on the side of caution. Spiritual purpose is not connected to anything material. Spiritual purpose is not connected to anything material. So you know what? You want to be spiritual, but yet you're trying to gather up all these things that when you leave here will mean nothing to anybody. Because I've seen it with my own eyes where parents struggle to pay off a house saying I'm leaving an inheritance for my children. And the first year go around, taxes are due at the house. They don't pay it. And the second year when the taxes come due, somebody goes and buy all the hard work, blood, sweat, tears, and toil that that parent put into that house to leave an inheritance for the tax certificate, which is considerably less than what the house is worth and the toil, sweat, and tears that was put into it, into the purchase. So spiritual purpose is not connected to anything material. Rather, a spiritual purpose is about establishing a set of values, principles, and beliefs that give life meaning to you and then using them to guide the decisions and actions you take. It's a, spiritual purpose is about establishing a set of values. Where should that set of values come from? Should that be guesswork for us? No, it's in there. Bible. Principles and beliefs. So there, there's proof again that we shouldn't be compromising in our walk. We shouldn't be, well, Pastor Catherine can't see me, so I'm going to over here and do that. You know, it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be those type of things. Things we do in secret and you think nobody knows, they know. There are no secrets. What is the purpose of life according to Yeshua? According to the Bible in John 17, 3, the meaning of life is to know Jesus Christ. And this is eternal life that you know you, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The meaning of life would be incomplete without knowing Jesus as the one who came to restore God's original design in us. Hint, he's pointing us to the Father. To tie this all in, he told Moses to tell Pharaoh to let my people go so they may worship me. This leads me to another point. We know that they went into the wilderness to worship him. Wilderness, and take note of this, is a place of purpose and not performance. Wilderness is a place of purpose and not performance. So when you find yourself in the wilderness, you should be asking questions. Why am I here? What am I supposed to glean from this? What is the lesson that I'm supposed to learn? How can I walk out of here better? How can I walk out of here closer to him? That's the purpose of the wilderness. For we know worship means what? To obey. They were led out of bondage. We like to say they came out of bondage. No, they were led out of bondage into the wilderness to worship. That was the purpose. For, for the New Testament folks, I have something for you. Yeshua was led into the wilderness to be tempted. That was the purpose. Your wilderness is for you to discover some things and not act out. Leviticus 23 and 40. 
Leviticus 23 and 40 says, and ye shall and ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before your Lord, the Lord your God, seven days. So let's talk about the actual sukkah, because it's detailed just like our father. He didn't, these things didn't just roll off from anywhere. There was reasons behind it, and I'm going to give you those today. Nehemiah 8 and 15 reads, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities. So does that mean we should just be having a feast right here at New Heights and nobody else can come and join us and be a part of it? That they should pro publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. So we know it says as it is written because Nehemiah had found the law where they weren't doing these commandments and they were reading and trying to rediscover. That was the message Pastor brought on us about um, being doers. So we look at this, there were five, five different type of branches that Yahweh described for them to get. So let me tell you the meaning of these branches. Myrtle and pine indicates that he sustains our life, both natural and eternal. Here's, here's scripture for that. Isaiah 41, 17 through 20. Verse 17 reads, when the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Verse 18, I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. So you know, I'm going to start right there. He said, I'll make the wilderness a pool of water. That's even proof that when we're in the wilderness, just seek him. He'll take care of everything else. Stop looking around at the wilderness and saying, oh, me, oh, my. But realize that the wilderness is a place of purpose. Verse 19 says, I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shittar tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine, and the box tree together. Verse 20 says that they may see, and know, and consider, and understand together that the hand of the Lord have done this, and the Holy One of Israel have created it. So myrtle and, plant, and pine was his reminder that he will sustain life both natural and eternally. I'm going to put a disclaimer there, eternally if you accept to be his. So let's talk about the palm tree. The palm tree signifies wisdom. And I have two verses for you on that. Psalms 111 and 10. And it reads, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I could, that's enough, that, that could be a whole sermon right there. Because we don't fear him, that's not wise because you're not going to live with him. You're not going to tabernacle with him. You will be lost. A good understanding of all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Proverbs 4 and 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So now we know he put the palm tree there to let us know what wisdom means. Then the branches of thick trees indicated or signified that there is no other besides him. Regardless of the size, he is the great I am that I am. These branches are were the covering. And if you stop to think about what each one of them meant, that's pretty powerful. That he covered them and they had to look up and be reminded of what he really is 
to us. The sukkah was a temporary dwelling, just like our tenure here on earth. It's a covering or its head is the grace the five branches represent the grace or the power of Yahweh. The olive branch rep or the olive tree represented his chosen. When you accept him, you are chosen by him. It represented that it sustained life and that it gives wisdom. And it reminds us that there's only one true and living God and his name is Yahweh. There are five items listed in scripture. The number five equals the grace of Yahweh, which is his power. And we are blessed by his power, not of our own. I found this very interesting. He told them to use branches. And we know branches are separated from the trunk of the trees, which is their source for survival. So if he took the branches and told them to put it over, that was the second reminder that he is the source of our survival and not we in ourselves. They were placed on the top of the sukkah. Their attention had to be drawn to the roof because of the sun, the moon, the stars, and even rain. Because we know this is a rainy season. The heavenlies which, were, which we are trying to make heaven our home. So when we look at these branches, we think about what they mean. We look up at the top. It should remind us what we're striving for. We're striving. I think we're all here because we're striving to make heaven our home. I believe Yahweh chose the branches because just as the branches were separated from the tree in which they came, we are separated from him because of the sin of Adam from which we came. Leviticus 23, 43 says that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. If you need any other reason or looking for an all-conclusive reason on why you should partake and celebrate this, the feast, it's because he is I am. He is the Lord our God. Finally, brethren, he would not have us ignorant. He says, our generations, so that our generations may know. You may ask, know what? If you haven't gotten it by now, that he has made a way for us out of bondage to know that he is our Lord and our God. I leave you with this thought. What's your purpose? By the way, that's the title of this message. What, I leave you with the thought, what is your purpose? I will give you a hint. It is to worship, to obey, not what you want. You don't have the option to pick and choose, but the volume of the book is required. Pay attention to the details. <laughs>